Good afternoon and welcome to the next installment of United Way of the National Capital Area's Changemaker Education Series. I'm Scott Mengebier, Director of Research and Evaluation at the United Way of NCA. And for those of you joining us for the first time, United Way of the National Capital Area is uniquely positioned at the intersection of public, private, philanthropic, and nonprofit sectors to bring the rest best resources, individuals, and organizations together to solve the most pressing issues our communities are facing today. This is the fourth in a 10-part Change Makers Education Series, where we connect with trailblazers and thought leaders in conversation about trends in our region and our solutions that advance equity in our community. Today, we're going to be focusing on the ongoing challenges in bringing greater equity and safety to the LGBTQ community, and in particular, youth who identify as LGBTQ. Young people today are living in a world filled with the duality of hope and risks. On one side, we see inspiration in how the LGBTQ community is represented in popular culture and society, how young people are embracing their identities and sharing it openly at younger and younger ages. On the other side, the world has been and continues to be a dangerous place for the LGBTQ community. There are more youth than ever identifying as LGBTQ and they are facing major challenges at all levels of society. From discrimination and hostility at home and at school, searching for jobs, finding housing and belonging in their community. LGBTQ youth across the country need greater resources and lasting support if they are to survive and thrive in today's political climate. The good news is that here in the national capital area and across the country, there is resilience. Organizations like SMILE, stands for supporting and mentoring youth advocates and leaders, leverage local and national data to inform their work in empowering and supporting youth through their programs and advocacy. We are honored to be joined by the Deputy Executive Director of SMILE, Jorge Membrino, to share his perspective on the issues at hand and how his organization is working to provide solutions in a perilous and ever-shifting environment. Jorge, welcome. SMILE has been at this for 38 years. They offer programs, education, and advocacy. I would love to hear you um, share a little bit about yourself and how your organization approaches the challenges that LGBTQ face. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, Jorge, he and his pronouns. Um, so I'll talk briefly about just the why of our organization and uh, how we got here. Um, I would say one common thread that I think all of us will understand and one other thing else is just the community response. Um, so SMILE started in 1984 based on community response. Folks were being hospitalized because the city of D.C. didn't know what to do with LGBTQ identities and how to work with them. They were saying, you're too butch, you're too femme, I have no idea where to like figure out services for you. And so the community got together and said, let's figure out how to build community support, but also an advocacy side of that work. And so in that time, SMILE has grown uh, to provide youth services uh, to youth as young as six years old, all the way up to about 30 years old. And that could be our Little Smiles program, which is for six to 12 year olds. It could be our Rise Up Activist uh, Camp, which is happening today. Uh, it started yesterday and uh, will run through the weekend. It could be through our Gender and Sexuality Alliance work that we do. It could be that community exposure and community just in embrace of our youth. Or it could be our housing programs or clinical services programs, which offers free housing to our youth to get them to a place that they want to get to, or clinical services, which offers free affirming mental health care to youth in the area. That's phenomenal. I, I'm, I'm excited. I want to hear a little bit more about the uh, the Rise Up conference that's taking place this week as well. Um, I would love to touch on some of these programs, and you, you mentioned a few of them. Uh, let's talk about it in terms of, you know, how the data will inform the programs and the programs informs the data and how you how SMILE and, and, and the programs that you're offering can empower youth to, um, to use both of those things to their advantage as well. Um, just to give, give us a sense of scope that we're talking about here. Uh, we know that data describes around the, the world around us and can play a critical resource to fight discrimination and channel those resources to the need of the community. But the scope of it is really that I think that we're looking at an estimated 2 million youth who identify as LGBTQ aged 13 to 17 in the U.S. And from what I hear is that you even work with uh, ages even younger than that, 6 to 12. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, it's our Little Smiles program. Little smiles. That's great. All right. And that number is rising. That number is rising. Gallup's national survey shows an increase from 5.6% to 7.1% of all U.S. adults who identify as LGBTQ. 
Now, this increase can be partly seen in the generational gap, which is widening. 21% of the LGBTQ population are born between 1997 and 2003 and are now adults. This forms that sort of Gen Z label that is applied to that, that, that segment of the population. And that 21% is double that of which the millennials or the folks, you know, that would be my age and my, my generational group who identify as LGBTQ. And this is even farther away from even older generations. So the LGBTQ population is growing and it's younger. But at all levels of society, their, their, their lives are fraught with risk. Let's start with housing, which you mentioned. This is an essential resource for stability and economic prosperity. But we know that affordable housing is in short supply in the US, right? For instance, queer and transgender youth are vastly overrepresented in the unhoused population. We've seen that 7% of the youth population, right? But they make up over 40% of the unhoused population. And this is both the case in nationally and in DC. Furthermore, LGBTQ youth are two times as likely to experience homelessness in the U.S. than their non-LGBTQ plus peers. And among the unhoused population, these of uh, this this group of of young people are at elevated risk of of hardship, which encompasses assault, trauma, trafficking, and early death. Black youth who identify as LGBTQ, and in particular young men, experience the highest rates of homelessness from this subset. So all of this is to say that there are really challenging, really serious challenges around housing that um, surround the LGBTQ youth population. And SMILE, you are providing youth housing services in the DMV region and been doing so for many years. And you provide those tailored wraparound centered services. I think that you mentioned the clinical services that you provide. And, I, and from what I understand, that they, they're dovetailed together. So you provide them as a sort of a holistic wraparound uh, approach um, could you tell us a little bit more about those services and how you end up making those decisions about who you serve, where you serve, and how you can respond to their needs? Yeah, for sure. Um, it definitely is a full wraparound approach. Uh, I always like to think of it as like bookends, um, working with our youngest youth, 6 to 12, and then with our youth who have experienced homelessness. It's it's like we are trying to fix the situations um, that have led to our youth to experience homelessness. So like on the advocacy front, but then just trying to figure out where youth are going to land and find success, especially when they're 18 plus. And then at that younger age, trying to figure out, well, like, let's help build a world with them where they won't end up on the side of experiencing homelessness. And so try to bookend things. Um, as far as our housing services, data played a huge part in it. Um, as you heard some of the, the stats there on just what's been going on, not only in the area, but also in the country of the youth experiencing homelessness here in DC, 40% identify, and that's like always within about uh, one or two percentage points, 40% uh, identify as part of the LGBT community. So we take that data, which we collect here in the city itself. So there, every provider in the city who's working with youth we all get together for nine days in September and we hit the city and we count everywhere and everywhere they're like that youth are interacting. Um, and we administer these surveys and figure out how many youth are experiencing homelessness. And from there, really boil down the data to figure out, well, how many are experiencing homelessness and have had a history of trauma? How many have an experience of like domestic violence? How many are identifying as part of the LGBT community? From there, we're able to take that funding and or those, um, that data and actually ask for funding from city council and the mayor to say, here's the hard data on what we're seeing. Here are the investments that we need to make to be able to start solving the homelessness crisis. And so when we launched our initial program, it was based on that data. Uh, we looked around the city. We knew that there were uh, at least one or two providers providing LGBTQ specific work in that um, in the youth homelessness space, but they're always going to be uh, more. Um, and we're always gonna need more. And so even if we think about data in terms of like the data collection piece of it, um, our data is only as good as the folks who are answering the questions. And so it could mean that like, you know, we're capturing 40% of youth experiencing homelessness, but there are definitely many more who refuse to take our surveys or are accessing services elsewhere or might be coming into the city from other states to be able to access their services. So the number is constantly evolving and changing. But when we launched that first program, we launched it with a, kind of a, a hope, really, uh, trying to figure out 
what that would look like for us. For Smile, it was the first time we were venturing into that space. What we were able to do is take the data from the youth count, take the data from the point in time count, which also happens across all of the country, um, and say, all right, we know that youth are experiencing this. We know that youth are experiencing trauma. We know that uh, the experience of homelessness is beginning for 18. So that means they might have been connected to another service. So all of those things boiled in. How do we build a model that's really going to support folks? And so we leveraged our experience working with LGBTQ uh, youth for since 1984, and we were able to design that first housing program. And based on the funding we were able to get from the city, we were able to launch a program for 12 youth. Now, what I will say is that data collection uh, at that survey level is one thing, but that anecdotal evidence and that like those day-to-day -day surveys that we get from youth helps to inform our other programs. And so uh, our other programs have been built in scale from that. And so our first program, which is for um, up to 12 youth, it's up to two years. Um, so you're not paying rent, you're not paying utilities. And the goal of the program is number one, to build an affirming space. That means when you show up to those doors, you know that this is a safer space for you to not only exist, but be able to find freedom and thrive. And so based on that, um, that mindset are you able to find uh, a future that they are looking for not one that's been impressed upon them not one that says you've got to work a nine to five and these are the only jobs available to you but one that says what are your entrepreneurship opportunities what are the areas in which you want to grow and what does freedom and independence look like for you and not necessarily as i'm defining it and so our youth and within those two years are able to get to that space now, our second youth housing program, uh, from what we were seeing, is higher rates of trauma um, across the entirety of the system and across the entirety of the country uh, meant that we needed more clinical support and meant adding in for Youth House 2 an extra case manager uh, who is clinically trained. And also it meant adding 24-hour support, 365. So that means like every single day there is somebody on staff there to support our youth because we know our youth work non-traditional working hours we know that there is nothing about support that is limited to a nine to five or a ten to six we know that on the holidays our youth might be um, having re-triggering thoughts or events and means of, like being able to be there for our youth whenever they need it because that first stage of like affirming is huge but that second part of like consistently affirming is even stronger in that saying that we're going to be here in the status that we have and that mindset that we have and we're going to continue to do it constantly so youth house two evolved from there and what we were seeing is all right so we've got two years of this runway for youth to be able to get to a point where they can launch into their goals some of it is just breaking down what does time look like for a lot of our youth especially for our youth experiencing trauma the concept of time is can sometimes be difficult that means like for youth who are like, you know, literally uh, homeless as HUD defines it, meaning like they were living on the street or places that were not meant for human habitation. Um, the concept of time is day to day. Um, so if you ask somebody, where do you wanna be in a month? It's a tough thing to like really wrap your head around. So it's like, where do you wanna be tomorrow? And then when you like start to build that again, that affirming space and the consistency, we can say to them, where do you wanna be next week? And then where do you want to be next month? And now let's really work on your goals about where you want to be excelling. So um, what we are seeing is for a lot of our youth, two years was definitely enough for uh, a huge portion of our youth across uh, our programs and then other programs is that not enough time. And so we needed a longer runway. So our extended transitional housing program addresses exactly that. So instead of two years, it's up to six years in our program. And that one's also much more, I would say, clinically intensive in that um, we've just built many more supports around it because of the high clinical needs that we were seeing for youth that needed a longer runway. Um, and so that could mean, um, you know, having, again, clinicians on site, but it also meant uh, direct partnerships with core service agencies, which provide mental health care and meant uh, providing uh, direct referrals to financial literacy for all of our programs and uh, providing direct access to like workshops that actually lead to employment, not just a certification to have a certification. Um, but it, more than anything else, it meant um, providing that safer space for a long time so our youth could have time to heal, grow, trust, and then move from there. Um, the last two programs that launched within the last year are number one is our rapid rehousing program. Now, this is a HUD model. 
uh, that is national. But what we do is, so instead of like that site base where our youth are all living together and, you know, youth house one, 12 youth, youth house two, 14 youth, our extended transitional housing program, again, 12 youth, this program supports up to 15 youth. And instead of them being on in one location, it's like you are getting your own apartment. Um, and your name is on the lease. And so you've got that financial freedom where you're able to grow into the person that you want to be within that space. And it allows a lot of space for growth. And of course, there's case management around it. There's direct connection to all of our services that are available. Um, but we want our youth to be able to, within that space of time that they're in that program, to be able to start paying into rent, start paying in utilities and find that freedom to, it doesn't feel so jarring when you leave a program where everything's taken care of. So then when all of a sudden you're like looking for your own apartment and you're like, oh, that first rent is due and utilities are due and there's that furnishing cost, all those things hit all at the same time. We're helping you get to that place and helping with support with the financial sides of it. The last program I will mention for our housing side is our Department of Health and uh, SMILE program. So this is meant to tie housing to healthcare. I think we all know that housing is healthcare, but this is a way for us to be able to actually produce data from this program and take that nationally with the Department of Health and say, all right, this is for up to um, eight men who have sex with men to increase PrEP adherence in order to reduce rates of HIV and AIDS in the district. Now, there are other departments of health who are watching this model to see if it works, and that way we can launch or help other centers launch this across the country and different cities to make that same investment so that they can see, okay, investing in housing and like removing barriers and really building up support is what's gonna help reduce rates of HIV and AIDS. Phenomenal, wow. All right, so I took in a lot there. Uh, let me <laughs> let me still a couple of things that really kind of stuck out to me there. Um, one of the things is that, I, that I heard here is that there is a, a sort of a complementary cycle of things kind of moving together, right? Is that there is the, um, there's the, the, the hard data that you're getting from the large sort of one point in time count or the DC youth count, right? Where you kind of collect, you mass a, an enormous amount of data that you then use to help leverage into developing those first initial programs where you're working with that smaller um, housing unit that you mentioned where there's 12 youth and you're you're saying, okay, now we're going to complement this with what we understand from clinical practice is what is going to build a, a, a supportive and in, in a supportive environment, right? So uh, affirming, affirming, you know, providing support, and affirming space, providing that consistent presence and support that you know that is going to have that that positive impact on youth development. And then that in itself it, it, cascades into more benefit, more benefits, right? And saying, oh, now we have greater trust. Now they're able to, you know, provide, you know, move from that day-to-day -day mindset to something a little bit longer, maybe even thinking about what they want to do next week or next month, or next year. And then that in itself is, is informing data that you're collecting to learn about what is next, like what, what else do they need, right? Is that, is that, you, do I got that right? That there's this cycle of data informing practice and practice informing data? Yeah, absolutely. We call it, uh, so we refer to it as like evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence. <laughs> That's exactly it. All right, excellent. And the, those programs then move into this sort of, you, you, you were able to expand upon it, move into different spaces and actually provide those transitions at, and those critical transitions for the youth. I mean, you're, you, you mentioned the little smile folks. Who are moving into, and then of course, you know, that's more preventative work. Then you have your your the, the youth who are who are experiencing uh, housing instability, and you're providing that kind of support. And then you're also finding, you know, helping build those bridges into the transition as they get to that 18 plus. But then of course, as you kind of build that sort of structure where things are building onto it of evidence-based practice, practice-based evidence, is that you then also see, hey, look, here's an additional need that we need to do. You know, the, we're going to adopt them the, the HUD model for rapid rehousing. And now we're even going to develop a new pilot. And this pilot with the, um, with the, in partnership with the Department of Health is something that may be able to scale out itself, right? And then again, this idea of let's put in the practice in place and then really collect the data that's around that to help support it, right? And that, that seems to me like the pilot itself will then generate even more evidence and more data for other um, services and other service providers to be able to, Im to imitate as well. Is that, does that seem about, about right with what, what the plan is for the housing services? Yeah, absolutely. If you're looking at the Little Smiles program too, um, I mean, there, there is so much of the data that we have to look at all the time in order to provide funding to solve issues. Um, Little Smiles is designed, um, you know, obviously it's a preventative measure for uh, other maladaptive factors later on. But what I would say is, 
at some point we will start gathering data on like what does it mean to support youth at the youngest ages and to see like their happiness grow their life satisfaction grow like their uh, family units be able to adapt the schools and the other places where they exist be able to adapt and change and grow because these youth are then empowered to be able to make those changes and create that world and so i think there's definitely always like the sad side of statistics, but I always say it's like, this is the nicer side of statistics where we're like seeing like, what is investment in youth to make sure that they are happy look like? Um, and how does that then uh, fluctuate throughout the rest of their lives? And what would you say is one of the things, both between the housing and what you just mentioned about the youth smiles? Because I agree, I think that that, uh, you know, the, the, the investment that's put in early on has this sort of um, multiplying or exponential impact on their life trajectories as you move along. So, you know, that we, we've always seen that, you know, intervening early and often is going to have a positive impact. From your I, from from your experience with the housing or the little smiles, is there anything that the data really surprised, you know, su surprised you and your colleagues with as you guys were learning and developing new programs? Is there something that the data really kind of revealed that you guys didn't know before? I would say uh, there were some intersections that I think we all had an idea of, but got to see it um, more as we did more and more intakes for our youth who are experiencing homelessness. And it was, number one, the experience of homelessness that is generational. Um, and number two, the, um, the process of an area that's growing like D.C. And then you've got generational trauma and poverty and precarious housing plus uh, the rates at which uh, folks of color experience that. So if we look at the data in DC, I would say of all the youth are experiencing homelessness, and then if you boil it down even further, the youth experiencing uh, homelessness who are part of the LGBT community, it's about anywhere between like 90 and 95% are folks of color. Um, right. So those numbers are just starkly overrepresented. Um, and we always say representation matters on one end, but overrepresentation on this end, it's just awful. And right. so um, what we have tried to do is do a lot of advocacy with that data uh, to make sure that there are allocations for our youth to be able to even have the opportunity to succeed here in DC, because we can build out these programs and we can provide them two to six years of support. But if from here, there is no place where they can afford market rent, that is, we are basically setting our youth up to fail. So that's one of the areas where we've really tried to do a lot of advocacy, but the data itself showed us what we need to be advocating for next as our youth are able to move through our program. That's been really helpful. And that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, revealing those type of things, because we did mention that, you know, the black youth and especially black uh, young young men of color are are experiencing the highest rates of housing instability. And this type of in, this type of intersection between um, different types of your identity, all facing the same or difficult uh, challenges in life can have a compounding effect. And, and you know, once experienced with that trauma, the trauma can deepen and be even harder to, 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 to find um, solace and repair and, and support. So the, the resources are really important. I, I, I really am I'm curious about, let's, you know, to, to sort of segue into another as aspect of it, and you kind of really talked about it in, in sort of the, the way that there's a trauma-informed housing with, you know, full-time staff and clinical, you know, clinical support. Um, I, I know that that probably emerged from a need of things that you were seeing as you were growing these programs. I, I will I'll turn back to the data real quick just to give us a, 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 um, some things that we've learned from some of the other um, resources and research that, that, that to provides information on this, but that the serious impact on youth mental health, right? And the, the, we, we spoke to the positive benefits that you can have with preventative, but with the, the, the young smiles and, and the preventative um, activities that you can do. If you don't have that, then and in what's happening for many, many, com many communities across the country, that really these hostile environments and limited access to the resources are having these serious consequences. I mean, Trevor Project, which is another great resource in addition to Smile, uh, I published a national survey um, from 34,000 LGBTQ youth and said reported that 45% of those, right? So we're talking, you know, 15, 17,000 uh, youth uh, reported suicide ideation in one in five trans and non-binary youth reported an attempted suicide in the past year. Now, suicide is a major, major risk of death um, for, for the youth in, in America today, and it's overrepresented in the LGBTQ community. These rates are higher 
even higher for LGBTQ youth of color than their white peers, which is what you were just mentioning there, um, Jorge. Now, what's even worse about this is that 60% of LGBTQ youth who wanted mental health care in the past year were unable to get it. So I would love to learn a little bit more about how SMILE and your partner organizations, because I mean, I think you even mentioned about the fact that in one of your extended transitional housing, you're, you're, you're feeding in an integration with other partners. Like how are you finding which partners you wanna be working with? How do we know that the mental health resources are gonna be help, you know, addressing this, these, um, these, these challenges of depression and suicide ideation? So I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I think we, we all saw the, the growing need for mental health services throughout uh, the pandemic. I mean, that it was readily apparent. Uh, we saw rates of substance abuse rise. We saw feelings of isolation, depression, anxiety. Um, all of that scaled up. If you were uh, somebody who was also at risk of losing employment or a risk of uh, losing housing, or you were already experiencing homelessness, all of those things were compounding factors. And so when we launched our clinical services program, some of it was to deal with those specific issues and really address them head on. So it meant, you know, if therapists are completely tapped out and they've got these long waiting lists, but you are somebody who needs help now, what is the option? And so right. the thing that we are also seeing is that even if you are a qualified therapist, being a qualified therapist to work with LGBTQ youth is a very different thing. I always say it's a specialization, much like general practitioner into a neurosurgeon. So how do you then, like, you know, support all of these youth who are in need? And so we um, we launched our clinical service to pro a program to specifically address uh, all of those factors. One being access. So you know, having access to therapists who are affirming, who are part of the LGBT community, who look and love like our youth. And then what do you do as far as like getting there? So we've got gift cards for Uber. We've got uh, transportation benefits. That means that like if you know youth have a tough time getting to us. We're able to supply them with Metro gift cards because we're right across the street from our, the Metro. Um, and the other part of it is the cost of it. Um, if you go to somebody who is very qualified and very good at their job, they should be paid for that work because a lot of them are LGBTQ folks who have taken up the mantle of really supporting other folks. And so sometimes it does mean that a lot of folks are in private practice, which is expensive out of pocket. And so our services are completely free. And we did that on purpose, not in order to like begrudge anyone being able to make a livable wage with their expertise, but in order to say, all right, now there are folks who can't access that and we can absolutely take care of that. And so we're able to partner with a lot of uh, folks on the outside that could mean like Whitman Walker, other community health centers to say, you know, let's have a mutual referral network of like, if there's a, a youth that comes to you and they're looking for services and you're tapped out, send them to us. If we know that uh, there's somebody like who is looking for a very specific service that you're specializing in, we're going to refer them to you. So we're able to build a network from there. And the good thing is that it's not a, it's not a just us thing, which is great. Um, so there are other programs in the city like Latin American Youth Center and Wanda Austin Foundation that have community counseling aspects to them that we work with constantly. Um, and part of it is just like our long history of working with them where we don't have to then like go in, make like a seal of inclusivity to make sure that like language is right, the treatment is right, the trauma responsive is not it trans trauma responsiveness is there. But those uh, relationships have been established throughout time. Now in cases where we are building relationships, we do like to do a warm handoff. And that means sometimes like you have phone calls with who their clinicians are, you sit down for coffee, you look at their paperwork, you look at who they're hiring, you talk them through the entirety of it, because if I'm going to refer somebody there, I want to make sure that it's a positive experience. And I want to be able to say, oh, I know somebody at X, Y, and Z, let me connect you to them directly. As far as the integration in, within our housing programs, the fantastic thing is like, let's say one of our youth is in our housing program and Sometimes you do not want to get therapy where you live, which is totally understandable. Um, so our youth are able to access our mental health services here on site um, at our main office, which is separate from our youth housing programs. And they're able to say, oh, okay, you know, like I, you know, I'm getting more and more comfortable. And I would say what I'd call therapy ready, like getting more and more comfortable with like chatting with somebody. Um, can you connect me with someone? And then what the case manager does is they hand it off to the clinical director to make the referral. And that's a direct form handoff where they can recognize the name of SMILE behind it as something that they have learned to trust, but then also they know they're going to be taken care of because it's somebody that the case manager has directly connected them to. That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to ask you more questions about this. So the <laughs> idea is that 
one of the, one of the things that really kind of comes to mind is again this sort of marriage between um, the data and the humanism that you have to kind of build into it, right? So part of it is that hey, we've built these relationships, we know exactly who we're working with, and we've we've taken the time to um, establish a, a network or a community of, of different sort of partner organizations or places where we can um, access resources and improve the access of resources for the for the youth population. But that seems like there's a really a lot of involvement and involved work that goes with it. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about the lift that comes with this. You know, you meant the seal of you mentioned the seal of inclusivity. You mentioned the warm handoffs. You mentioned the idea of building relationships with new partners. I mean, as we obviously are going to be thinking about how we could, um, you know, in, increase and improve the access to resources for youth across the DMV region. What would you say? You know, what, what could you speak to about that sort of the legwork, right? The emotional and relational legwork that needs to go into building out a network like this. Yeah, for sure. So I would say first and foremost, talk to the youth who are receiving the services. Um, if we are not doing that, we are designing programs and expecting people to show up. This is not a if they build it, we will come situation. This is a, let's ask folks what they're looking for, what they need, where the gaps are, and how we as a community can help to fill those gaps. Um, as I mentioned earlier, community response is a big theme here at SMILE. And so any program that's ever been created at SMILE has been because we've been in direct conversation with parents, social workers, doctors, but more than anyone, the youth, um, and asking them, what is it that you're looking for? And so that's part of it. The second part of it is that um, from that messaging is like looking through what's available um, as far as, you know, what what can we be doing and what are other centers doing that um, so we don't have to replicate it? Who can we partner with? Um, because like, let's say somebody is right now working with um, families. Um, and there's a fantastic organization here in D.C. called Rainbow Families that specifically works with LGBTQ identified families. And so if they are doing something well, can we partner with them to be able to expand a little bit more? Because as an or as a nonprofit organization, if you are looking for any kind of expansion, it's really hard to do by yourself. You really need some community input, but also you need help from folks who are already doing the work. And so being able to partner immediately expands the scope of what we can do and makes it a little less cumbersome for just one organization to hold the weight of, whether now it's split between two organizations who are able to cast a wider net have a larger audience and be able to support folks. So that's part of the legwork there and the lift. The other part of it is making sure that you've got folks on staff who are qualified to do the work well um, and being able to, I always say like balance passion and knowledge um, because it takes a tremendous amount of passion to do this work day in, day out, but it also takes a tremendous amount of knowledge that we either receive through a million avenues, but also like that direct voice that we get and youth with lived experience and having them on staff and youth action boards and making sure that they are influencing the policies that are also at work. Part of the other part of it, or the other uh, legwork and lift of it is, there's the financial side that um, takes a lot of work. Um, and so there, I would say that there is no one at Smile who has just one role. Um, I think all of us feed in one way or another into different development opportunities, communications, networking. It's like there is almost no, I will say there's like no time at any happy hour that I've ever been to where somebody hasn't asked me what I do because it's a very DC thing um, where I'm not like, let me tell you about Smile. Uh, because even if I'm not there to like talk about what I like me personally, but like talk about the the work that we're doing and like how our youth are impacted and how they can really be paying attention. And so that networking side of it is huge because uh, in order for any of us to do this work, it takes that community investment, it takes that community input, it takes the development team behind it, it takes the comms team behind it to be able to say, this is how our youth are thriving, here's how you can support us. Mm -hmm. And I see that there's a lot of intention around building out the skill, the talent, the, know the knowledge base so that you can provide a really great base of support and community network for that. And that everyone really takes that to heart as well. I can, I can, I can definitely sense that from, from what you've described. And now that I've kind of spoke about how we could go wide, I'm also kind of curious about how we could go deep because you mentioned the financial uh, investment about that. And we're going to, we're going to talk about policy in just a second here. The idea is that um, with the financial part of this and also the networking, you know, I'm going to talk about smile. I'm going to let you know how it's going. We do use data to really make that persuasive argument, both to funders, to policymakers, and decision makers across the board, but also to parents, uh, educators, um, potential network partners. Um, you really have to kind of bring 
you're bring the A game with you every time. I mean, you know, you mentioned a happy hour of networking. You're going to have to have those right, um, those really right sticky data facts, right, that are going to stick with you well beyond that. And I think that's really important. One of those ideas that comes with the intersection of different service providers and services that you're having, you said you're going to part with two organizations, they have complementary skills, they're going to be able to provide the best possible service to the to the youth. You're getting to the point of dosage, right, which is to say the longer and the more exposure that the youth has to organizations like Smile that are life affirming to um, uh, service providers that are affirming and inclusive and, and, and will provide a good and safe and consistent space, that's extremely difficult to capture data wise. How have you guys been successful in kind of measuring that depth of service that you provide to the youth? Because I think that would be helpful for, especially for organizations, other organizations that are trying to capture that same sense of you know investment that goes into the work. Yeah, so some of it is, um... What I'll say is the the quiet moments is what I call it, um, because it's easy to talk about success in terms of like somebody who we call graduates from one of our youth housing programs that go on to do great things. Fantastic. It's the day to day work where you can see um, a behavioral adaptation of like. I am feeling a joy I haven't felt before. And when somebody expresses that, um, it, it's a it's a huge what feels like a huge accomplishment. Um, or if somebody says, you know, I came in to receive therapy at the clinical services department, this is a story that happened recently. And they said, I didn't come in ever having to worry about my trans identity. It was just like, a, I knew this was going to be accepted. So I got to just talk about other things whereas other folks might wanna really dissect the entirety of me as a being versus you who is just like, oh, okay. It sounds like you had a tough day at school. Do you wanna talk about it? Um, and like that has been tremendous to see. Um, now, what I will also say is that there are definitely moments where our youth are like, I hate this. And I'm like, yep, that makes sense. Tell me why. Um, and so being a, oh, like open and receptive to that feedback is so important because I think youth are the best litmus test of like what's working and what's not working. And so that means like having weekly and monthly meetings with our youth and any of our housing, housing programs and saying like, here are all of the updates. Here's everything that's going on. What do you all have as far as feedback and what can be changing um, and being able to receive that. And so like that could mean we've been able to drill down on some services in that I mentioned earlier, the actual employment certification things where like there's a there are programs in the city that are specifically going to work with LGBTQ youth around certifications and employment. Um, but what they're reporting to us is that if employers are not affirming, then what's the point of the certification? Right. All right. So let's drill down on those services and figure out how to improve those things so that the experience our youth have while like in uh, any of our SMAP programs can be more fruitful, not just in our housing programs and our clinical services programs, but then the moment they step outside of here, because we know that as much as we would love to hold on to our youth and really support them forever, they go off and they need to succeed away from us. And so that means like being able to take that feedback, take it outside to the other provider and say, here's what's needed. Here's how to advocate for it. The other thing I will say is within those quiet moments, it's when folks can express to you and continue to show up. Um, part of the trauma responsive care is that there's that immediate trust. But when somebody starts to show up, like, you know, they've got week one through six and they're like, not showing up to case management because why would they why would they trust you you're just another provider and the long list of providers they've met with before um but when they start then showing up or they start calling you and they've like experienced a crisis or when they call you to celebrate a great thing in their life i'm like those things are areas where we drill down and we look at and helps to influence influence further policies where we say okay you know we can teach other organizations that like this is in no way, shape, or form uh, a straight line of progress. Um, it, you know, you, you've got to bounce back and forth, and being able to then demonstrate that throughout time is super important in sticking by youth as they are doing that. And then so as we are revising any policies, any handbooks, or anything like that, saying to our funders and other folks, like, there is nothing that in a report that I can give you at month one that's going to tell you that there is as tremendous progress as the way that you want to see it. So we will say there is uh, progress is what we see is like being able to move back and forth between how somebody is feeling and how they are succeeding in terms of how they're framing it. And that to us, that is progress. It's not it's not always just linear. Thank you for sharing that. That's fantastic. I mean, my major takeaway from here is that 
the LGBTQ youth who are the topic that we're we're sort of discussing, the target population here that we're discussing today, it's their voice that it needs to be centered on. It's 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 really, you know, going back and trusting their voice, right? <laughs> and 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 taking, you know, having the flexibility to adapt to the challenges or, you know, as you say, you know, their progress at their own rate, like me, meeting more than where we are and accompanying them as they kind of go through that process, but also celebrating. The progress, as you mentioned, the quiet moments, which I think is really phenomenal. And I think that kind of segues nicely into my last, you know, uh, topic I would love to, to hear a little bit more about is, and I think it's a big part of your, 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 um, your programs and services that you provide is empowering youth voice, right? And really um, providing youth with the, 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 the resources, the, the, the know-how and the data to be able to advocate on their own behalf so that they can build a sustainable future for themselves and, and for the entirety of the community. Um, from what so zooming out a little bit, we know that the system itself is 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 on the attack, right? To, since 2018, 670 anti-LGBTQ bills have been filed, with 2021 being considered the worst year in recent history for state legislative attacks against the LGBTQ community. This year, not much better, 238 and counting. Um, this is going to affect every aspect of a youth's life, and 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 just really quite sent, you know, quite quite frankly, just. Um, mitigate any sense that they would be able to feel a sense of belonging in this country, right? It, it, it impacts them in the schools, seeking access to health care, to jobs, to housing, and it and impacts every aspect of this. I would love to hear about how your youth advocacy programs have been, and you know, in partnership with other service providers and, and getting those resources are going to be supporting LGBTQ youth here and in other parts of the country. Um, so, you know, it's, it's wild. Um hearing those numbers about that many policies, it's always so stark. Um, and what I will say is that DC very much a bubble. It feels like, uh, you know, we are, are doing our best to support our folks here in DC. But um, as we're seeing legislation just change across the country, our youth are keenly aware that while legislation has borders, that hate doesn't. Um, and so as they are seeing the rhetoric nationally change as they are seeing that um, a lot of these hateful voices are being given a megaphone and a political career um, that it it's always at like next door. Um, and so how do we then address that on multiple fronts? Number one, there's the mental health care side of it, of like making sure that our youth can feel supported and we can help to Help them build like those the future that they want within this space um but knowing that our, some of our youth leave dc knowing that some of our youth come in from other states and knowing that some of our programs which um have like more of a national scope especially our virtual programs youth are existing in those spaces and so what we've had to do really early on is number one kind of do a, a legal gut check across the country um so like if you know we've got youth um all the way in like you know, in another state where these policies are being leveraged and they are trying to access services, how can we best support them? And that means calling other centers um, and partnering with them directly and saying like, all right, so we are, this is what we're hearing. What are you seeing? How can we be supportive of each other? Um, as recently as two weeks ago, I was on a call with um, some board members from an organization in another state, and they were reporting to me what they were seeing on the ground and the youth that were calling them and the parents that were calling them. And that was that was a huge thing to hear is like parents were scared to get support for their kids in the way that they knew their kids needed support, which is so antithetical to the way that um, I think these policies are written where they think they're preserving family values, but now parents are scared to support their kids in the way that they're supposed to be supported. And so the other part of it is, um, as we are building out these programs and the, the, we do extend the national scope, it's like partnering with organizations like Centralink, which do have that national voice, finding other organizations who are already doing this work or have been doing this work and saying like, how are you doing this? You know, What are the things that we should be looking out for? How can we build this out in an intelligent way? Um, and then as far as the policies themselves, teaching our youth about them, because it, it like doesn't help to to omit them from the news um you know we, as much as we want to protect them we know that they are going out into the world and they're seeing it so it's better to have the conversation and teach um and then teaching them how to advocate so we're like part of the the work that rise up our activist camp does is there are a lot of activists 
who come in and they teach our youth. And so I think last count I heard, we had about 200 youth who were registered for this week's uh, activist camp. Um, they are learning from activists across the country. Like, here's what activism means to me. What does it mean to you? And how can you take up the mantle of activism wherever you are? And so part of that is like issuing micro grants to a lot of our youth so that if they want to hold pizza parties for the rest of the year at their Gender and Sexuality Alliance, they can do that. Um, if they want to start a small nonprofit, they can do that. If they want to help fund um, like any campaign, whether it's like writing out some blogs or zines or whatever they need to get messaging out around policies they're changing, they can do that. Um, but it also means that they are the voice of it. We're just giving them the tools to do it because without that, we know that like if we are at the point that we are now and all of us as adults who are managing these policies and seeing these policies and if we haven't been able to change it, we are hoping like how the kids who are coming up and learning all these tools are going to be able to create a way better world than the one that we have right now. And I, I, you know, with the, with a growing population, right. 21%, then uh, let's hope. I mean, I think that I, I, there's reason to be optimistic. Um, I think that's phenomenal. And I, I want to, I want to ask um, just a little bit more, just one final question about around solutions. And I think we can kind of help package a lot of the things that we've talked about before I do, I want to invite all of our, uh, our, 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 our guests here today that are, that are tuning in. Um, if you'd love to, you know, enter your questions into the Q and A or in the chat, we have um, some colleagues of ours. We're just monitoring those and we'll be able, you know, as they come in, we'll be able to kind of uh, bring them to, to Jorge uh, to discuss. Um, please feel free to, to, to chime in uh, into the Q&A. Um, Jorge, this has been great. I, I wish I could keep on going. I would love to, you know, hear more about uh, how you're connecting with folks on the individual level. I think the micro grants is a phenomenal idea. Like you said, you know, meeting them where they're at, providing the tools and resources and, and amplifying their voice and helping them lift up is, is, is phenomenal. And then that hopefully together will carry, you know, um, will arrive at this sort of critical mass that can have an impact on, on, on the larger pieces, you know, of the system, including policy. Um, zooming all the way out, right, backed up to this sort of nationwide level where we have youth uh, across the country, they're neighbors to each other. They're all having their different experiences. They're all, you know, living life and, and finding out who they are, you know, affirming their identities and, and finding themselves in, in communities and in parts of the country that's just not uh, welcoming and, and, and affirming for them. Um, let's talk about how some of the solutions that you that Smile is 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 championing uh, is is really seeking to address this at all levels. You know, you mentioned the federal uh, piece with the, the around funds, um, the state level about how you have to work across different parts of that, and of course the local level where you're um, providing those critical resources around housing and, and and mental health. Is there something that you could say that could help us walk through a little bit about how different parts, you know, where where our where our spec, you know, the people who are tuning in today, where they're sitting in their chair, how they could help and, and weigh in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I would say federally paying attention to any of the policies that are coming uh, through every administration. So for every policy that, you know, every, what feels like at least lately, every policy that's enacted by the executive office, um, it could be within four years that that policy is changed, or it could be that the Supreme Court is changing something, um, which we are all very aware of. Um, and so one of the things like really paying attention to the policies because there is no policy that is overarching that is targeted at one community doesn't affect multiple communities. And so as we are thinking about, um, like let's just say the, the legislation on LGBTQ youth, um, thinking about the way that it's going to increase the needs of mental health care support for LGBTQ youth, which means the gap in services and the amount of just therapists that are available to work with youth, um, the mental health care and the healthcare industry will have to then increase funding in order to be able to supply and support that. And so that's like one just small area where like one policy all of a sudden affected multiple aspects. The other thing is, and that's like at the federal level, if you're looking at the state level, the state legislations um, that are coming through the there are community based organizations who are actively working to fight them, but then there are also community based organizations that are actively working to continue to support youth, continue to support families, and also to financially stay afloat. Um, if funding is being pulled from those organizations, uh, then a lot of them are going to have to look to partner organizations in other states or other communities to be supportive. And so I would say statewide. 
um, really staying in tune with what is the closest center to me that could require support and asking them, how can I be helpful? Because they are going to be the experts in like, you know, wish we wish we had a team of lawyers who was ready to support us because sometimes it's very expensive to have like a team of lawyers on hand as a nonprofit, but like having volunteers who are like, I would love to do this pro bono is tremendously helpful. Or if you've got like excellent comms experience or resume experience, any of those things, being able to reach out to those centers and say, what are you looking for? Here's everything that I do and here's how I can be supportive. And then at that local level, um, politics are so important. Um, I know it's super cliche to say, but like local elections matter because local elections affect the community that you are directly in touch with constantly. And so if we think about just like ripple effects of any policy changes or any of the interactions that we have, the more and more that we can as a community rally around specific things to support folks, then that expands even more. And so that ripple effect goes to state, state goes to federal. And it's the same thing on the way back down. So I would say paying attention to those elections, paying attention to the policies, and then seeing how can I be supportive of any of the organizations or the folks who are working within that arena? And how can I leverage any experience that I have to support them? That's fantastic. Thank you. And, you know, just I think to just to compliment that what you were saying is that if you want to find out where the, the closest center is to you, you can log into things like Centerlink, you can look on smile.org. I think you point to some resources as well to help uh, anyone who's might be interested in, you know, if they're saying, hey, you know, where where is the closest center to me? You know, if I'm not living directly in D.C., where where can I find uh, what is the, the closest to me? I think you can find it through those two resources. Is that correct, Jorge? Yep, that is correct. Awesome. Um, we do have time for just one question, and I think it's a great one. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to read it out to you. It's um, a college student that I, for a college student that identifies themselves as LGBTQ, but parents don't. Um, do you recommend referring them, and I'm assuming that they mean the the parents, to your organization for mental health services? So it um, it depends on what they're looking for. Um, so let's say. Well, I'll answer this two ways. One, if the college student is looking for mental health services, I would love to say that all colleges are well-trained in this. They're not. Um, but I would say finding, um, there's always an uh, affirming network that ends up being built up, um, usually through sometimes psychology today where you can find services. But um, if folks ever want to call us, we can help them identify affirming mental health therapists for uh, any like students, youth. If it's for the parents, there are groups um, everywhere who do specific, not just support, but psychoeducation around like, what does this mean? Or what does this mean? Or how can you best be supportive? And sometimes, honestly, that conversation is just like, ask questions of your of your kiddo and then asking them like, you know, what does this mean to you? What does your identity mean to you? I can't make any assumptions. I can't leverage any of my experience in this, but what does that mean to you? And then how can I best support you in that? And so sometimes it's not even having to like fully understand every aspect of the LGBT community. It means like just being able to listen and affirm identity and celebrate who somebody is. Um, and so I would say on doing that on two ends, one, there are parent support groups out there. And then the other one is for the student being able to find a network by reaching out to any community-based organization who usually has a pretty good uh, pool of folks they've contacted in the past. Okay, so in, in the the follow up to this question is that the mental health services are offered remotely if you know let's say a college in Richmond right so if we were to say Richmond, which is within you know. Uh, this next door next door to the national capital area um would we say that you know we could contact say uh smile or or center link or trevor's project or any of the other really great national organizations that are out there and they should have a sort of maybe offline network that they can kind of look up to see uh, who might be in their local area. Yeah, absolutely. Like as soon as you say Richmond, I'm like, okay, let's call uh, the folks over at Equality Virginia, or let's call folks in Safe Space Nova, and then try to see, you know, who in their network do they have that's available, or if they don't have somebody right off hand, who can they connect me to right now so I can make a phone call. And I think that really speaks to what you were saying about the solutions is that funding at the highest level, but also at the local level, is really going to help continue this 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 network this this really this network of affirming organizations and people who are going to be in place where they and to meet the youth where they are and center their voice and, and support them in anything they might need whether it's for them or for their parents but really the the idea of, of continuing to fund these these organizations so that they can stay connected to each other and provide those services is really critical for the success of this 
Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of the, 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 the time. The hour just flew by for me. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation, our, our, life, our fireside chat today, and um, would love to share out that we have some additional resources that we're going to be posting to our site about um, that Smile has shared with us. Um, please go and check out Smile uh, and, and all the great work they're doing. Um, they have the Rise Up Conference that's happening right now. Uh, all this through this week. Um, we have really enjoyed learning a little bit more about the boundary pushing and trailblazing uh, efforts that you guys have been doing for over 38 years. And we are uh, thrilled to be a partner um, with you guys. And we look forward to hearing a little bit more about the initiatives that you're doing uh, in, in future change makers. Our next change makers is in August. And um, Jorge, thank you again for, for joining us today. Really appreciated it. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here. If you guys have any uh, additional questions, do not hesitate to wrap up uh, to um, reach out to us and to get in touch with uh, your friendly uh, LGBTQ life affirming uh, organization near you, like Smile. Thank you, guys. Have a great one. Thank you. Bye. Take care.